Hi guys, I'm Lindsay. Um, left Debbie up there, sorry, Debbie the Dolphin. Uh, I'm Lindsay Hall, and this is my video project for Psych 252 Theories of Personality, Spring Semester of 2016. Um, so to start off, I just want to talk about how personality is super important because it affects our life outcomes, um, really to what matters to people such as um, how relationships are. Personality will help determine whether or not those relationships will work. Um, what our personality does, it, it kind of exposes us to certain situations and other people. And I think that's really important for human beings. Uh, I'll kind of go into that later when I talk about interactionism. Um, uh, it also helps us find out who we are as people. Um, it's kind of funny because personality is who you are as a person, but to say that it helps you find out who you are as a person. Um, it should make sense after I explain my theory, but pretty much um, personality, in my opinion, builds from day one, or day zero, I guess, minute one. Um, personality will build until it becomes more stable when you're older. So, um, in terms of my theory, I thought it would be logical to go in this chronological order. Um, but I want to explain that my theory is some sort of a cycle. I don't want you to think about the cycles that we learn in biology where, you know, a plant or a bug starts here and then all these things happen and then they release these sperm and stuff and then the next plant or next bug starts again the exact same way, same process, same everything, just blah, 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 blah. Um, my theory is less of a cycle and more of um, a spiral um, to say that things do happen again, but it's not the exact same. They build and it builds and changes and it continues to grow because um, to me, personality is continuously growing. And then we start again at the next birth, your child, and then they'll continue to grow, but it'll be different. It won't be the same. Um... So with that in mind, um, I guess we'll start with my theory. Um, to start, I want to start at the very beginning, um, which I guess would be birth, or before then, actually, zygotes, when we're in our little single cell forms, um, the little ball of cell that is magically holds all of our genetic coding that will eventually turn into who we are. I, I would love to go over the biological process of that, but that's just not what we're doing today. Um, it's super cool and interesting. Um, but pretty much how I see it is, um, how I like to think about it is how Funder talked about how much of that genetic coding is, um, not so much individual, like 99% of that coding according to Funder is identical to across humans. So 99% of my genetic coding is identical to yours because it makes us human. It's what makes us human. What the turn of our pelvis or um, the way we hold our head, where our hair grows, stuff like that. Um, that's what makes us uniquely human. And actually 98% of that um, is similar to chimpanzees, according to Funder again. Um, but what behavioral genetics is really focusing on is that 1% that varies between us and any other human. Um, I have 1%, 1% of my genes is unique to only me and no one else shares that with me. Um, I get 50% of that 1% from my mom, 50% from my dad, um, and then I grow and I'm born and I'm now just this blank slate with a predisposed personality um, ready for experiences. Um, when I say predisposed, I don't mean that I have a set personality and I'm going to have that personality. It's not, it's not an absolute thing. Um, predisposed is more I'm inclined to have this personality. It's a suggestion like, hey, your parents have these personalities mixed, gives you this. Um, do with it what you want. Um, it's just here. Um, it'll show how I react to things. It'll, I'll explain it as I go. <laughs> so, um... This is where environment comes into play. Um, the book talks about how our brains are plastic, and what that means is it's constantly changing and adjusting to what is happening. 
which I think it's super cool. And <laughs> it's really hard to wrap your finger around the fact that this thing in here is morphing and changing. It's probably changing right now. Um, so I'm, we are continuing learning as we have more and more experiences. And when you're a kid, most of your, or when you're a baby, actually, most of your experiences are just those experiences that your parents put you in because you can't really choose the experiences you're on when you're in a stroller all the time. So, um, what I think about with, um, these environments that may have formed my personality would be, you know, going to church every Sunday and then most Sundays and then only on Christmas and Easter when my family is just the religion, my personality, like as a Christian, you know, you go to church, um, family dinners. I have this importance of family dinners. Uh, we would wait for my dad to get home from work before any of us can eat. And we'd always eat at the dinner table. Um, most of this sounds like culture and everything, which I think is kind of different than personality, but it has a big play in your personality because there's certain personalities that are acceptable in different cultures and whatnot. Um, but right now just focusing on, um, the culture and the environment that I grew up in. Um, you know, we're a very open family, you know, we're just kind of free and open, you know, dancing all the time. Um, athletics are very important. Um, I grew up in a very competitive family, a very outdoorsy family, very active. Um, we had to learn to be very responsible growing up with chores and homework and everything. Um, we learned to be honest, which as a high schooler, it took more of trial and error than anything. It was a lot easier when I was younger and where honesty wasn't that big of a deal, but high school got, got a little scary, but, um, I learned, um, that honesty is very important because of uh, what my parents taught me and what my parents exposed me to as a kid. Um, so I, kind of, I want to talk about how interaction plays into my theory. Um, this is a more accurate theory that combined the person-situation debate, um, kind of more of a compromise, but more, makes more sense, um, that persons and situations are constantly interacting with each other. It's not just one thing or the other. Um, they interact with each other to produce that behavior. And there's three parts of interactionism, which... Um, funder lists in the book. Um, neither variable of person or situation has an effect by itself, and they work together. Um, the second one is certain types of people go to or find themselves in different types of situations. And the third one is the way people change situations by virtue of what they do in them or how they react. Um, so to kind of put this in perspective of my own personality, um, I... Just to kind of start us off, we look at the five big traits, which is, I should know this, we talk about this all the time, um, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and openness. Um, I have it written right there. I could just... Anyway, <laughs> so these big five traits will impact our life outcomes through interactionism. Um, so the example that he gives for the first part of interactionism, where neither variable has an effect by itself and they work together is how you have a big pot of coffee and an extrovert takes it and an introvert takes it and how they um, respond to the coffee is very different from one another. Like the extroversion that had a bunch of coffee will be all off the walls and introversion may not. Like they'll have a negative effect on it or something like that. Um, for me, I think about neuroticism and finals where... I'm a relatively neurotic person, and so when finals comes around, I'm stressed beyond compare. Like, um, maybe the entire month, it feels like finals month and not finals week. Um, and I stress out about every little thing, like maybe my bed's not made properly, and then I'm frustrated because I can't do my homework because my bed's not made. Like, so that could be just a total other thing, like OCD, but, you know, we'll talk about that some other day, maybe next year. Uh, <laughs> The next part would be certain types of people go to find themselves in different types of situations. So an extroversion is more likely to put themselves in a large party and meet lots of new people, whereas an introvert may choose to just stay at home um, and watch some Netflix, which is totally fine. Um, that's me. I definitely am. I would definitely prefer to just hang at home, not even Netflix, just clean my room or do some homework. I just I'd rather be alone most of the time. Um, I would describe myself as an outgoing introvert, though, um, where I do like to be with other people. I definitely, um, as an athlete, you kind of have to talk to other people, and I like it. People are great, but I would prefer to be alone 
more often than that. <laughs> and the final part of interactionism, the way people change situations by virtue of what they do in them, however they react. The book talks about the biker bar and when there's a fight, when you're allowed to be radical and crazy and stuff, um, certain people will be will push that limit and be extra crazy, be extra rowdy and stuff. Um, for me, I think I'm the type of person who, if I saw a bar fight, I would either kind of just back away like, oh no, that's really bad and dangerous. Please don't hit each other like that. Or if it's someone I knew, I would be mad at them for fighting and be like, stop. Um, okay, so moving on from attraction. That was a big part of that. Um, so we as humans have this unique ability to analyze our environment, situations, and experiences. And so this is where I see f phenomenology, I think phenomenology fitting into my theory. Um, Funder talks about how awareness is everything, and really is. Awareness is everything. Um, the present moment of an experience is very important. How you perceive it, how other people perceive that same experience, everything. Um, Phenomenology, in my opinion, kind of talks um, more about <coughs> <coughs> self-criticism and stuff. Um, I want to say this starts to happen when we're in high school, but, you know, for me personally, I don't know about anyone else, but throughout high school, I seem to be more concerned about what other people thought of me, what other people thought I was, like who I, they thought I was. I guess it's not necessarily a bad thing. It matters It matters to me whether or not people like me. It matters to me whether or not, you know, I'm coming off the way that I want to. Um, but phenomenology, the self-criticism, I think, comes more into play um, in the college years when you're taking these big classes or you're learning a bunch of stuff. You're really cliche but you're finding out who you are as a person you're exposing yourself to certain situations blah 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 and the way you interpret those situations and that type of thing um kind of builds on your personality and who you are um so for me personally once I got into college I found you know religion is important but my religion is kind of I don't need to talk about it I don't need to um, pray. I don't need to do any of that stuff. Um, it's different from what I was raised as, but it's also um, just something I've learned through experience is that it's not as important to me as it was when I was a kid or as I thought it was when I was a kid. Um, I'm still outdoorsy because I keep putting myself in the situation of being outdoorsy because it's something I really enjoy. Um, same with athletics. Um, I'm a competitive person. Still, I was raised as a competitive person. I remain a competitive person. And I'm even more of a competitive person. So I get into athletics. Um, and I still have the sense of responsibility that I gained from my parents with all those chores and homework where I'll go home and do all my homework before anything else just so I, you know, I, as I said earlier, I have this higher level of neuroticism where if I don't do my homework, I'll probably freak out about it later. Um, so early in the trade approach, Funder talks about how our individual differences become more stable as we get older. So I'm thinking of phenomenology as the last step, finalizing until we can decide, like, hey, this is who I am. I'm stable now. You don't <laughs> literally say that, but as we get older, we understand better who we are and we have a stable um, feeling, um, understanding of who you are as a person, who I am as a person. I'm definitely not there yet, but I can see myself getting there soon, um, probably, you know, late 20s, 30s. Well, I don't want to say that soon. That's later <laughs> from now. Um, and then to talk about how my spiral wraps back um, or continues to grow, um, you've done this process. You have a stable personality. You know what it is. This other person has a stable personality. They know what it is. You get together, marry, blah, 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 have a zygote together. Um, <laughs> and so they'll have a mix of your 50% of your stable personality, 50% of theirs. Um, and then because we're plastic, that personality is now embedded in us. So that genetic code can be 50% into the zygote. 
that you have and then the spiral continues because they'll go through those experiences though they will be different experiences so they will build differently and everything so um that's my personality theory <laughs> enjoy